Welcome, everybody. I am extremely, extremely glad that there's so many of you here this morning. I know it's a beautiful day outside, but we're going to have other beautiful days, right? Yes. And uh, I believe that you're going to leave today with the understanding and the realization that it was worth it to come to church. Amen. Today um, and, and this weekend, we are commemorating and celebrating an extremely important event that took place in the early church in this very, very, very infant stage. Many of you are probably not aware what today is. I'll explain it to you as we go along. Growing up as a Catholic boy, very devout Catholic, Catholic church and Catholic school, I remember hearing about Pentecost. Now today, if you would ask the average Christian, what is our, what is our big holidays? What's the big holidays for a Christian? Everybody would say, well, it's Christmas and Easter, okay? The early church didn't start celebrating Christmas till about 350 years after the event took place. If you were to ask a person during Paul's time, what were the big holidays for Christians, for believers to celebrate, they would have said the resurrection and Pentecost. Today is the day that the church world marks Pentecost Sunday. And what is that all about? I'm going to explain it to you. Now, um, the word Pentecost comes from the Greek language. Penta or penita is the Greek word for 50. Pentecost is the 50th day after the Passover. We would say it's the 50th day after the resurrection, okay? This holiday is not only being celebrated by the Christian church. Actually, it's really more celebrated by Judaism. This day... The Jewish communities all over the world are celebrating what they call Shavuot, which is the holiday commemorating when Moses was given the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. You remember the story, Moses? You remember Charlton Heston, the movie, <laughs> Fire, Pharaoh, the whole bit. Okay. So this is the day that on the church calendar um, celebrates Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church, which happened on the day when the Jewish world was celebrating this commemoration of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk about it a little bit today because it's extremely, extremely important. Uh, It's unfortunate that throughout the centuries, the the, the Pentecost experience has has been diminished, has been kind of redefined and, and almost made an option. In the early church, what happened on the day of Pentecost literally launched the church into taking the gospel all over the Roman Empire, and then eventually to the uh, outermost parts of the earth. So um, what I want to talk about today is this this holiday. I want us to go back to the original day. I want you to see the significance of this day. I want you to experience what the Israelites experienced on that first day that we now call Pentecost, okay? In Exodus chapter 19, we have the the story for us recorded. If you remember back when when God appeared to Moses in that burning bush, how many remember that one? In the burning bush, the bush was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. And God spoke out of that to Moses and commissioned him to go to Egypt to rescue his people and to bring them out. And God said this to him. Now, remember, the burning bush experience took place on Mount Sinai. Okay? Now, from there, Moses leaves and goes to Egypt. But God said to him, he said, you're going to go to Egypt. You're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. When you rescue them, you're going to come back to this mountain and worship me. Okay? God told him what's going to happen. You're going to go there. You're going to get them free. On your way back from the promise to the promised land, I want you to stop by here. We're going to have a worship service. Okay? So God uh, kept his promise. And, and what happens is God meets with Moses and gives him certain instruction on how this event is going to play out. So here we are in Exodus chapter 19, verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain, we're talking about Mount Sinai, to the people. Now, remember, there's probably anywhere from two to two and a half million to three million people that have come out of Egypt. And now they are there at the base of this mountain. They are encamped there. They're on their way to their promised land. All right? Moses goes up on the mountain, receives instruction from God, comes back down on the mountain and explains it to the people. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people. In other words, he he told them to make themselves holy. And they washed their clothes, obviously as, as an outward expression of their getting rid of the sin in their lives and getting prepared to meet to meet God. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. There's something about the third day in the scriptures. There's something about God always promises specific things that are going to happen. 
after three days, and this is one of them. So they've got three days to prepare. And then it came to pass on the third day, in the morning, that there were thunderings and lightnings and the thick cloud on the mountain. Now imagine you're there, you're one of these, these millions that have gathered, and you're at the base of this mountain, and you see this, and the mountain is, there's lightning flashing from it, there's fire coming down on it, there's smoke covering this mountain. And, and, and now, in the background, there's a trumpet sound. And it's not, it's not a trumpet that's being blown by some human being. This is something that's coming from heaven. This is a spectacular event. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, it became louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered by, to him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Moses goes up, and he's going to spend 40 days there. There are 40 days. He's not only going to receive the Ten Commandments, but he's also going to receive, which he later writes down, the entire book of Genesis. The book of Genesis had not been written down yet. It had not been revealed yet how the creation of the universe had taken place. God revealed all this to Moses while Moses was up on this mountain. Okay? This is the day that God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. And it is a day filled with fear. It's a day filled with awe. It's a day where you're, nobody's standing there taking lightly what's happening. You are seeing a mountain in front of you on fire, lightning shooting from it. The earth is shaking. A, 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 an, an, an unnatural, supernatural trumpet is blowing louder and louder and louder. If that didn't get your attention, I doubt if you were still living at that point. And so, so, so this sets the tone now for the rest of what we call the Old Testament. This sense of fear, this sense of awe, this sense of, uh, I love God and all I want, but I don't know if I want to meet him yet. You know what I'm saying? That this sense of like dread. And, and the law brought all of that sense of unworthiness and that sense of, I can't do this and I'm never going to be able to fill all these commandments. And this is pretty much the kind of atmosphere that was created until Jesus shows up on the scene. This must have been a frightening experience. Everyone heard and saw the spectacular event that God had just, just put on for them and just comes down from heaven and comes in his majesty and, and fire and smoke and earthquakes and all this. But it pointed to an even more spectacular event that would happen in the future. And that's the event that we're celebrating today. To the day that Moses received the Ten Commandments that impacted Israel, the day that the Holy Spirit came to earth on the day of Pentecost impacted the entire world. And God had promised long before that this was going to take place. God had promised that the day was going to come in their future that the Holy Spirit of God would come from heaven and reside on the earth. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and he would come upon an individual Let's say if you were a king or a priest or a prophet, you would live your life just normal like everybody else, but then every once in a while, whenever as God willed it, the Holy Spirit could come upon you and then you would have a message from God to speak. Or the Holy Spirit would come upon the king and give him a strategy to defeat an enemy of Israel. Or the Holy Spirit would come upon a priest and he would speak on behalf of God. And then once that was done, once the battle was done, once the miracle took place, once the message was given, the Holy Spirit would depart. He would not stay on the individual. Amen? So Jesus shows up on the scene. And in fact, really, John the Baptist shows up on the scene. And the Holy Spirit is upon them, signaling a transition. God is going to be dealing with man in a very different way. Okay? So God had promised that this was going to take place. Uh, back in the Old Testament, there is a prophet by the name of Joel who wrote down what God had given him to say to the nation of Israel. And in verse 28 of chapter 2, this is what we have written, that God spoke to this man, Joel, to tell the Israelites what to expect in the future. Now, this is hundreds of years before Jesus came to the earth. And so the Holy Spirit is telling them, get ready, because this one is coming in the future. And it says, and it shall come to pass afterward, afterward, afterward. What does afterward mean? After Jesus came to the earth, after he went to the cross, after he rose from the dead, and after he ascended into heaven. 
signaling that there would be a, a different way that mankind related to God from that point forward. And here it is. It shall come to pass afterward, God speaking through the prophet, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us today because as believers, as soon as you said, Jesus came into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, guess what? The Holy Spirit came right inside your spirit. But to hear this pronouncement in a day when the Holy Spirit was not poured out on just everyone, that the Holy Spirit was only poured out on certain ones at certain times for a short period of time. This was good news to the people back then. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What does that mean? Your sons and your daughters in their future. He's saying your descendants are going to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The power of God will be upon them always. That's good news. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. In other words, the, the, we're going to take all the limits off. No longer is it only going to be the king, the priest, the prophet. In other words, all of my people, God says, all of my people will have the Holy Spirit upon them after that day, after Jesus comes to this earth and purchases our salvation. John the Baptist promised this experience of Pentecost. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is what John the Baptist said about Jesus. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you, say this with me nice and loud. He will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and fire. Man, what a promise that was made. He said, the one that's coming after me, he's, he said, I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. He said, but when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's going to be power, power attached to that baptism. Jesus himself promised the same thing about the Holy Spirit. It's recorded for us in John chapter 7, the Gospel of John chapter 7, verse 37. Jesus is at a feast, a major feast in Jerusalem at this time. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, which takes place in the fall. He's September, October. Okay, it's still celebrated to this day. And he goes to Jerusalem. And he's kind of like, if you read the whole thing in context, he's kind of like hanging back. He's in the background. And then on the one particular day, because most Jewish feasts are, are more than one day. And then there's the, there's the days that lead up to the feast, and then there's the principal day of the feast. And so that's what he's saying. What's saying here, what's recorded for us, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, he's in the temple in Jerusalem, multitudes there, and he cries out and says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, or out of, we could say it this way, out of his innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. Just rivers. Rivers of life just coming out of the, uh, each individual that believes in Jesus. Rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. A lot of fancy language. This is what it says, okay? This is what Jesus is saying, and then this is what John is saying about what Jesus said. Jesus is in the middle of this feast, and the, and the, and the high point of this particular feast is they would take tons and tons of water up to the Temple Mount. And at a certain point during the day, when this ceremony is taking place, they would release thousands and thousands and thousands of gall gallons of water, and the water would pour out from the innermost part of the temple, flow out to the outer temple, flow out into the streets of Jerusalem, a perfect symbolic picture of the Holy Spirit just flooding God's people. And while this is happening, Jesus stands up and says, is anybody thirsty? Let him come to me. He says, and out of your innermost being, is going to flow rivers, just like this water you see pouring out, just like the, the Spirit of God is going to pour forth and it's going to affect everybody's life that you come in contact with. And then John says, this he spoke of the Spirit, who had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. What's he saying? Until Jesus went to the cross, until he died on the cross, until he resurrected from the dead, the Holy Spirit could not come to earth to reside. But once Jesus rose from the dead, and once he ascended into heaven, in fact, the last day he spent on, on earth, we're going to talk about it in Acts chapter 1, he says to the disciples, I'm leaving. 
He empowers them. He tells them exactly what he expects from them. He tells them, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to be with you always. He said, but don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my Father. That was 40 days after, after the resurrection. 10 days later, the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, while everybody is going to Israel, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to celebrate this feast, celebrate the giving of the law, the 10 commandments to Moses. While they're there, something very supernatural happens. In Acts chapter one, before Jesus left, the disciples very reasonably asked the question, are you now gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they knew the Messiah, one of his jobs, one of his missions, one of the whole reason he's coming to earth is to restore David's throne in Jerusalem. This Messiah, this, this, this person would come and he would display tremendous miraculous powers and he would reunite the nation of Israel and he would, he would, he would kick out all the foreigners. He would, he, they, they believed he was going to, to, to kick out all the Romans and that Israel would be a free nation once again, a free kingdom. But they forgot that Jesus had been telling them, I'm going away, I'm coming back. I'm going away, but I'm coming back. They thought it was going to happen instantaneously. They didn't realize that there was going to be at least, that we know of, a 2,000-year gap between the time he left and the time he will return. And there's many reasons why I say 2,000 years. I'm, just, I'm not just throwing numbers out there. We are at the very end of those 2,000 years. We are at the very end of that time period. And not, not setting dates or anything, but I, I, I really, truly, truly believe that we are the generation that's going to see Jesus Christ return to this earth. But he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Look at verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive what? Power. That sounded real powerful. But you shall receive power. power. When? He said, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He said, that power is going to be for this reason, for you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and all over the earth. So he said to them, basically what he's saying to them is this, you're born again, because remember, they got born again on Easter Sunday night. You remember Easter Sunday night? They're in the room. They're all together. They're frightened. They believe that the Jews are going to come after them next. They're going to crucify him. Crucify them just like they crucified him. So they're scared. And that night, Jesus walks into the midst of them, just walks right through the wall. And here he is. And he says, peace be unto you. Shalom Aleichem. He's peace be unto you. And then he does something very unusual that had not been seen on the earth since the days of Genesis. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, just like God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became alive. The life of God was once again imparted into human beings. So, so they already got the Holy Spirit that night. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. But now he's telling them, wait a second, I'm leaving. I don't want you guys doing anything until you receive the promise of my father. So they were born again, but he did not consider them equipped enough to go out and do the work of the ministry yet. He said, wait, wait until the Holy Spirit comes. He said, when he comes, you're going to have power like you never have before. That was 40 days after Easter. If you grew up in the Catholic Church, we called it Ascension Thursday. 10 days later from that Thursday is Pentecost Sunday. 10 days later, as they went to the temple to observe the services of Shavuot, all of a sudden something very supernatural happens. Acts chapter two, verse one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, the disciples, the apostles, 120 of them, Jesus' mother is present. Mary Magdalene is present. The women that went to the tomb, they were all there. They were all in one, with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. What happened, what happened back at Mount Sinai? Smoke, lightning, fire, shaking of the, of the earth. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound of a mushing, rut, mushing, blah, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire 
And one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I'm going to read that again. I want you to pay very, very close attention. And they were, how many were filled? All. all. How many? All. All were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They were already born again. They're already going to heaven. But now Jesus had told them about the secondary experience that was reserved for believers. Amen. And it is reserved for believers even today. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why? Because on this particular feast, God had commanded everybody needs to come to Jerusalem to, to, to celebrate this feast. And so there's hundreds of thousands, possibly the historian Josephus said that during Passover and Pentecost, upwards of a million, a million people or more would come to Jerusalem. They'd camp out for miles around to be there for this feast. And so they're all there. Why? Because it's the day of Pentecost. They're there in the morning. They're there to celebrate this thing. And what happens? This, this, this event takes place. It's supernatural sweeping from heaven. It's this mighty rushing wind. And then they, they, they perceive there's flames of fire on all 120, and all 120 be, are filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in this supernatural language. And people from all over the Mediterranean world are there, all over the Roman Empire, all over the Middle East. And watch what happens here. And they were all amazed because everyone heard them speak in their own language. They were all amazed and marveled and said to one another, look, are not, are, are not all these who speak Galileans? Okay, and that was... In our, our terms today, we would say, aren't they country bumpkins? Aren't they hicks? Aren't they from out in the boonies? They recognized they were uneducated people. And they said, how could this be? Every one of us are hearing in our own languages them praising God, a supernatural event that changed mankind. And unfortunately, it's gotten buried. Think about this. On the day that Moses received the law, fear came upon all the people and they withdrew from God's presence. God even said, don't, don't, don't tell them not to touch the mountain. If they touch the mountain, they're going to die. Fear comes upon the people. On the day of Pentecost, the love of God was shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and they were drawn to Jesus as their Savior. On the day Moses received the law, 3,000 people died because they worshiped the golden calf. You can go find that in Exodus chapter 32. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people received everlasting life because they came to know the Savior. You can find that in Acts chapter 2. On the day Moses received the law, the people saw and heard a spectacular display of lightning and fire on the mountain. On the day of Pentecost, the people saw tongues of fire on the disciples and the apostles and heard them speak in unknown supernatural languages. Some of the common questions that get asked about this baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is what Pentecost is all about. It's about the people of God, the disciples, the apostles, the multitude that stayed with him. It's about them receiving an empowerment outside of themselves to live the life that God called us to. For them to be able to work miracles. You don't see any evidence of miracles in the early church until after this baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then we see them working miracles just like Jesus did when he was alive. Common questions. How do we know that a person has received the baptism? Their experience will be the same as in the book of Acts. There is no indication that a person received anything else. They spoke in supernatural languages. The Bible refers to this as unknown tongues. In Acts chapter 10, we see this pattern following through. It's not like, because some, you know, some people have been taught, well, that was a one-time experience that never happened after that. That's not true. It is a pattern in the early church. We see it over and over again in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10, Peter, under the, under the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit, goes to the house of a Roman official. His name is Cornelius. He's told, go preach the gospel there. Cornelius gathers his entire household. He's a Roman official in the army. He gathers all his servants. He gathers all his family. He gathers, I guess, the soldiers that were close to him. And there was a whole group of people there when Peter comes. Peter begins to preach salvation and preach about Jesus. 
And verse 44 says, while Peter was still speaking these words, look at this, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision. In other words, the Jewish believers were astonished that came with Peter because they saw that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So what happened? They got born again and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just, just natural to follow through. It's unfortunate how the church throughout the ages has made it optional. It wasn't optional in the early church. This is the way it was supposed to be. My personal experience, and I don't expect you to receive anything because of my personal experience, I'm just telling you what happened to me. I thank God that I got born again in a church that stressed the truth of the word uncompromised. Nobody was there to tell me, well, that happened then, but you know, it stopped after the last apostle died. I had nobody to tell me, well, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. I had nobody to tell me, well, some people get this gift and some people don't get this gift. I read the scriptures, the same that was taught from the, from, from the pulpit. You get born again, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get baptized in water. Or some people get born again, baptized in water, and baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's one, two, three. Boom, that's just the way it is. Man developed all these doctrines and all these philosophies hundreds of years later. Years later, after the original day of Pentecost, Paul goes to Ephesus. And he meets a group of, a group of Jews there in the synagogue. And he, he begins to discuss with them salvation. And they're like, um, we don't really know what you're talking about. Because they had, all they had heard in Ephesus, and this is probably 15 to 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead, because there was no internet then. No telephones, no nothing. Word traveled very slow, okay? So he gets there and he says, well, well, what baptism were you baptized in? And they said, John the Baptist baptism. Now, John the Baptist baptism, the baptism that you and I experience is very different. John the Baptist baptized people to prepare them for Jesus to come. We get baptized because we believe that Jesus came, okay? And so they said they only knew the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance. They hadn't heard that Jesus came. They hadn't heard that he rose from the dead. They hadn't heard that there was the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul says, have you received the Holy Spirit? They go, we didn't even know there was one. And so he, began, he teaches them salvation. They get born again. And then it says that when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. The pattern is there over and over and over again. The Apostle Paul has an amazing experience with, God, with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's blind for three days. A man named Ananias comes to his house, lays his hands on him, scales fall from his eyes. He receives the Holy Spirit. Later on, Paul writes to the church in Corinth in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and says, I am so glad that I pray in tongues more than all of you. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit also. That is the pattern in the early church. Okay, it's there. Um, some people would say, another common question, is it for me? Is it for me? Because I know that some of you in this room have been taught exactly what I just said before, that this was true and it did happen, but it stopped after the last apostle died. But God's been raising up apostles for 2,000 years, so that's a whole nother deal. But look at this in the, in the, in the book of Acts in chapter 2. Starting in verse 36, Peter has been preaching a message of salvation to all the people that gathered there because when they heard the rushing wind, when they heard everybody speaking in these unknown languages, there's thousands and thousands of people there at the temple. So they all rush to Peter and Peter now takes advantage of this crowd and he stands up and he begins to preach a message about Jesus and salvation. They're convicted in their hearts. We pick up here in verse 36. Therefore, this is Peter speaking. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In other words, he's the Messiah. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's water baptism. And you shall receive the what? the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Has God stopped calling people? No. Then the promise of the Holy Spirit is for us today, just like it was that. I hope you're catching this. I hope you're catching this. Another question. Do we need to tarry 
I hate that word. It sounds so religious. But the truth is, Jesus told the original disciples the first time, wait. King James says, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my father. So there was a doctrine that developed in the churches, and unfortunately, even in the Pentecostal churches, that you had to tarry, you had to wait. And so they would have, they would have tarrying services and sometimes stay there six, seven, eight hours, people crying all over the altar, begging God to do something that he did 2,000 years before. You don't have to wait. We have no evidence of anybody in the scriptures having to wait. They got born again, they got baptized in water, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. You don't have to wait. Is it for you? Yes, it is for you. You don't need to wait. They waited one time in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came to earth. There's no reason to wait anymore. He's here. He's here. He's here. Hey, where is he? He's here. But you don't have to go to a temple in Jerusalem to experience him. Where is the Holy Spirit? Where does he reside today? In us. Paul said, know you not that you're the temples of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to wrap this up. I want to remind you of a couple of things. Remember that Jesus said those who believed in him should receive the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7. Remember that it belongs to all those who are already born again. Okay? It's a secondary experience after salvation. Not better than, not less than. It's secondary. You experience being born again first and then, <coughs> excuse me, then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember that is the next step in your life with God, to those of you that are already born again. And remember that the baptism of the Holy Spirit equips us to live on earth. That's the most important thing you should remember. <coughs> Jesus made it, made it very clear to the disciples. After they got born again, they're ready for heaven. Thank you. They're ready for heaven. But he said to them, I don't want you to leave Jerusalem until you receive this promise of my Father. Listen, I need you to take this very seriously. You are born again, you are prepared for heaven. But until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are not prepared for earth. Listen, maybe I can explain it this way. When we were all sinners, let me take a drink. <clears throat> Before you got born again, you were very comfortable here on this earth, yes? Yeah, because we're all sinners. Before we're born again, we got no problem going to the darkest, most degenerate places in life. We're comfortable. Why? Because this is, this, is this is our world. But how many remember the first time you walked into a church that was born again? And you went, oh, man, something's weird here. <laughs> I did. You know why? Because you stepped into a different kingdom. You were very, 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 very comfortable in that other kingdom, in the kingdom of darkness, because that's how we're born. But all of a sudden, we saw, I never forget the first time I came to a church like this. It was on Easter Sunday, 1984. I walked in. It was probably half the size of this crowd. Everybody had their hands raised. Everybody's jumping, shouting, talking in languages I didn't understand. And I stood there and went, these people are whack. These people are crazy. <laughs> but, but I knew they might be crazy, but you know something? They got something that I don't have. I knew it. I just knew it. I knew it. So I came back three days later and got born again. Sunday, was Easter Sunday? Wednesday night, I go to church and get born again. 9.30 at night, April 25th, 1984. And I got saved. And everything looked different. But as I continued to read the Bible, as I continued to go to church, I'm like, okay, I'm going to heaven. But there's something else that I'm supposed to experience. I knew there was, some, there was still people there that had something. I knew they had a power that I did not yet have. I knew they had abilities that I still not, did not yet have. And I wanted it. And so I would sit in a message just like this. And I'd say, Father, I want this. I want this power. In the middle of August, that same year, I went home one Sunday afternoon. My wife had taken the children and gone up north to see her mom. And I was in the house by, by myself. And I went into our family room and I raised my hands up. I said, Father, I hear all this thing about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm not, I don't know 100% about it, but I know this. If this is something you want me to have, and I believe it is, I see that the people in the book of Acts, they got born again and then they, they received this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I see them work with all kinds of miracles. 
I, I, I hear people in church praying in a language, praying. They have a language to pray with that the devil can't interfere with because he doesn't know what you're saying. But God does. I said, Father, I want this. I, I'll never forget. It was a Sunday afternoon in the middle of August. There had been a tremendous rainstorm here in Brick. The streets out here were flooded. We lived right back in this neighborhood. I went into the family room by myself alone, lifted up my hands and said, Father, I want this. And bam, here it comes. It was like somebody just dumped a bucket of water on my head. I could just, just feel this, this presence come on me and just began to speak in tongues and speak and worship God and praise God. And I'm telling you, I walked out of that room different that day. Oh, I knew I was going to heaven before I walked in that room. But I walked out of the room knowing, oh man, I've got to do something on this earth. I am empowered now to do something supernatural on this earth. Listen to me. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've already received Christ as Lord and Savior, you need this secondary experience. Because many, 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 listen, I've seen this now for 35 years. Many people who are born again are still frustrated. And the reason why frustration comes is you're trying to do the things without that empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I receive this? Many different ways in the scriptures. We're told that in, in, the, in Acts chapter 10 that while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they received. We see in, the book, in Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit fell from heaven on them and they received. But then we see other times where Paul laid his hands on people and they received the Holy Spirit. Peter lays his hands on people in Samaria and they received the Holy Spirit. The most predominant way we see it happen today is that people lay their hands, people that have already received, lay their hands on others who have not yet, and you receive. Uh, are you listening? Now, I preach this not to give you an information transfer, it's just so you can walk out and say what Pentecost is. For those of you who have not received this gift yet, and you've got to desire it, if you don't desire it, you're not going to receive it. But for those of you that desire it, for those of you who have seen in the scriptures what I've taught today as true, we want to make this gift available to you. You can walk out of this place today, not only born again, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only with the Holy Spirit within, but the Holy Spirit upon to empower you to do what? To live life on this crazy, degenerate, filthy planet. To live amongst a system that is contrary to God. But we can still overcome that system. Why? Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. If you want to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, come on up. Come up now. Come up now. Come up now. Prayer team, come up here. I encourage you, if you have not, you need this. Okay, if you're going to come up, come up, because I'm going to dismiss everybody else. Do you want this gift? Come up. Everybody stand up. God bless you. I pray that the Holy Spirit continues to reveal himself to you. I pray that Jesus continues to reveal himself to you. And I pray that if you know on the inside you're supposed to be up here, that you'll have the courage to get out of your seat and come up here. The rest of you, God bless you. You're dismissed. Go enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.